Well, good morning. It's great to be here with you again. This is the third time, 2015, 2019, and today. It's an honor that Julia and I can be with you and my assistant, Reham. And we're very glad to, I don't know if you know this, we're very glad to bring you some Jordanian weather here today, this weekend. <laughs> it's great to be here. I'm just so happy to hear all this news about the new members and the search committee. This is, this is a lively, loving church, biblical church. And I, I've known the history of this church for so long. Such an honor to be with you. And thanks for my friend, uh, Ron, and uh, for him arranging this. And he, we'll be having him in two weeks in Jordan. This is his 10th time to come teach for us. And we're so honored by his ministry in worship. <clears throat> um, bear with me as I translate from Arabic to English in my mind, and then from my English to your English. <laughs> and <laughs> so, okay, um, <clears throat> before uh, we begin in a sermon, I'd like to read from the text of Colossians 1, 24 to 29. Colossians 1, 24 to 29. I'm reading from the ESV version, as I understand this is the, the version used most in this church. Colossians 1.24 Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toiled, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of God. You know, uh, as you well know, the world is in turmoil. Politically, economically, socially, morally, <clears throat> It seems like there's an increasing resemblance to the, time, the times of the tribulation, the unprecedented times still in the future. It seems like it's closer to closer resemblance to that time. It can be discouraging at times. At times it may seem like, where is the Lord? As if he's absent. There's so much trouble. It seems like evil is winning. <clears throat> and it's easy to lose heart. And uh, the question is, what really keeps us going? Persistent. What keeps us going? This kind of persistence that brings result. It pays. What keeps us going? You know, uh, you know this, uh, the book of Colossians was written, the first part of it was, showed the uniqueness of the person of Christ. And that's in the first chapter, just about. And then it, could, it moves on to the stability of the body of Christ in the face of so much delusion and uh, incorrect doctrine. And, and that's where we are here today. He begins, Paul begins by thanking God for the Colossians' faith. And he prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will, that they would walk accordingly and be fruitful on the basis of God's action through redemption on the cross reminds them that this was done by the unique Christ who is the image of God, agent, sustainer of creation, head of the church. So he begins with that long prayer typical of Paul. Obviously, Paul is really burdened for the whole world, much like we all are, this church is. He has a whole world on his, on his heart. And um, he... he, uh, he he understands the challenges that they face. And we'll go into that a little bit more. But 
the, the question again is what keeps us steadfast? What keeps us persistent? You know, I think there are some principles here in this passage that hopefully would be helpful to us all. Um, first, we see in this uh, passage that uh, what really keeps us persistent is that we are <clears throat> called to share in his pain, the pain of Christ. Notice what it says. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that, that is the church. He speaks of Christ's afflictions as if, you know, here's, here's uh, Christ's afflictions, but they're lacking. And he's calling me to fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of course, this word afflictions does not refer to his sufferings on the cross, the sufferings for our atonement. That suffering on the cross was done once and for all. Where what he had done on the cross cleared us from all sin to all who believe in him. That's not what it's worth. That word afflictions used there refers to a different kind of suffering. And he spells it out. It's for his body, the church. It's the for the sake of his body, that is the church. That's what he, so in a sense, Christ is hurting for his church. And that suffering, that hurt for his church is lacking and he's calling on Paul and all of us to join in that, in that lack, to join him in this, in this suffering. Notice that uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when Saul of Tarsus, before he became the apostle, Paul was persecuting believers and the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and said to him, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you, he didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? He said, why are you persecuting me? So when the church is hurting, it's because he's hurting. Actually, he's hurting before we are hurting. We are to join him in his hurt, in his pain. It's like um, uh, the example of Moses uh, in Hebrews 11, it says, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Uh, in the spirit, he's led to understand that we, centuries ahead of the sufferings of Christ in, a, in that, and we know that all the Old Testament speaks of Christ, points to Christ, and he, he, he considered suffering for Christ, the suffering nature of Christ as a greater, greater honor than all the treasures of Egypt. And again, in Hebrews it says, let us go out uh, to him outside the camp, bearing the reproach, you know. And in, in the Lord's language, he says, uh, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, it's joining him in his pain. You know, <clears throat> you know actually, um, uh, there's a, a sense, <clears throat> but it's, it's really sobering when you read some portions of scripture speaking of this, of Christ's suffering for his church. Tip, uh, one particular passage shines out, and that is in the Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, in the letters of Christ to the churches, the seven churches. And we can assume that these letters to the churches are meant to be describing the church throughout history. Because uh, every letter of the seven letters ends with, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. So what Christ says to the church in Smyrna, the Holy Spirit says to all the churches. And in those letters to the churches, five of the seven he's unhappy with. <laughs> you know, it's either because of lack of love putting knowledge before love, or it's disregard for the truth, so much wrong teaching, allowing that to stay and stay, or it's really ignoring sin, continual sin. That's a third common element in these five churches. And then fourthly, it's the paying more attention to the outward than the inward. And he's unhappy with the churches. <laughs> And um, 
some churches do well, some do not. Uh, there's a, um, there's, but then Christ is continually seeking after, the, seeking after these churches, like he does with us, individually and corporately, giving second chances, pleading, pursuing. Sometimes he's pictured as outside the church, knocking to come in, asking for permission to come in. Sometimes he stays outside, he calls the believers to come out to him in these, in these letters, you know, uh, to have a fresh start. So Christ is really hurting for the church. We can imagine him today. You know, we think of the church worldwide. In Europe, the church is so, so weak, unlike it was before. So much has come into the church today, you know, that is, breaks our hearts. We never imagined some of the things that are happening. Uh, you know, uh, error becomes right and right becomes wrong and so forth. So he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I, I don't know about you, but Paul here is saying that it, what keeps me going is to realize that I'm called to share in his pain. He, he says, I rejoice. He, he, he draws power from it. You know, what an honor to join him in his pain. It's an encouraging thought in the middle of dark times to think that we are joining him. He understands. He's been there before we have been. He understands our world, understands the situation we're in. <clears throat> so, um, uh, you may ask, well, is it worth it? <laughs> is it worth all this? to suffer like that with him. Is it worth it? Of course it is. Not only are we called to, to share in his pain, we're also called to share in his very plan, what he is doing. It's a great plan. And he explains it like this, of which I became a minister according to the steward. Now he says according to, that's a plan. According to the stewardship, he's been given, given uh, a responsibility. It was entrusted to him to carry out a stewardship from God that was given to me for you. It's a transferable thing. It goes from Paul uh, to Epiphras, down through generations, down to us. It's a plan of God. He's at work. He's doing something. Okay? And he continues on. Uh, According to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, or literally to fulfill the word of God. So this plan revolved around the very word of God. And he's, he's been given the responsibility to speak scripture. That's our task. Authority of Scripture, the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of, word of God. It has authority on all matters of life. The Word of God. So here's that plan. It's a stewardship given from God to fulfill the Word of God. And in this, in this very Word of God, there's a mystery. The mystery from which the word, uh, in the original, it's mysterion, from which the word mystery came, came. And mystery does not really refer to something that is vague. It's more that something that was not known and now became known. It was not revealed, now it's revealed. What is that mystery? It says, a mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed uh, to his saints. Not only was it hidden and revealed, God also desired for it to be revealed. He says, uh, to them God chose, it was his desire, chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of this mystery. So there's this, here's a stewardship, a plan, transferable plan, centers around the word of God that contains a mystery, a treasure, okay? A mystery um, to make known 
how great among them the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Now, this, this mystery is engulfed in glory. Uh, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory. You know, that's typical point. He has these rich words, you know, one after the other. <laughs> riches of the glory of this mystery, just engulfed in glory. And when, we, uh, when the scriptures speak of, of glory, uh, it's, uh, it has to do with several things. It has to do with ultimate beauty. This mystery is beautiful. It's beauty. Not only that, it's, uh, it's perfection. All the attributes of God come together. It's perfection. It's beauty, perfection, but also speaks of necessity. You know, God is is a necessary being. He has to be for everything else to be. Everything depends on him. Actually, the word glory in the, in the Old Testament uh, comes f from the word kavod in, in Hebrew, which is the same in Arabic. It, it refers to the liver. You know why liver? Because it's the central part of the body and it's the heaviest. And so when you, when you glorify him, you liver him. <laughs> You make him central. You make him the heaviest in your life, you know. Think, uh, think of a river and a rock in the middle of the river, and, and the water goes around the rock because the rock is heavier. So he's saying this mystery of great beauty, perfection, and speaks of the necessity of the, the one and only true God. That's the, that's the, this, 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 uh, uh, mission I was given is engulfed in this mystery that's engulfed in, in glory, you know. And that's, that's God's plan. <laughs> He's saying, I've been given all this, and I'm transferring that to you. We're called to share in his plan. And, um, and what is, he continues. No, it doesn't stop there. He says, the mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles the riches of the glory of this, which is, here it is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wow. That's it. Actually, in a parallel, uh, parallel passage to this, when it speaks of mystery, it, it's in, it's, uh, in Ephesians 3, 6, he says this, this is the mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So all nations are partakers of the promise together, okay? So he's talking about a, a state, a great state for all nations. But here in, uh, in uh, Colossians, it speaks of how this came about. How does this happen that all nations can be united together in this glorious mystery? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, you know, there, um, <clears throat> our problem oftentimes is that we forget. We forget how rich we are. Whom is living within us. And whenever, whenever we sin or fall short, it's because at that moment, we forgot who we were, how rich we are, Christ in us. Now, there's a lot of theology here, by the way, a lot of theology. You know, it's, um, <clears throat> we've been justified. He's taken our sins away, and he's given us something. He took away our sins, and he gave us his righteousness. What? made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we may become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that amazing? That's a judicial act through what Christ did on the cross. But it doesn't come alone. This judicial state we are in comes with regeneration. We've been born again to new life, the newness of life in his resurrection. We have a new life. We have a new spirit. And his Holy Spirit lives in us. So we've been, there's justification, regeneration, glorification. We are headed for glory when there will be no, not only no power of sin, no presence of sin. And there, all nations will be together one day in heaven. 
And actually, you can put it this way. There's, there's so much theology, special, uh, soteriology, pneumatology, eschatology in this. You know, you can put it this way, that um, Israel is a promise of redeemed peoples. And uh, the church is the mystery of redeemed people so that it is fulfilled in the heavenly Jerusalem as the climactic gathering of redeemed people. So it goes from Israel, the promise, to the church, the mystery, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the climax, when we're all together in heaven in glory. This is where we're headed. Where does it begin? Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can see the Trinity at work here. That one God. Um, you know, actually, serving Christ is the greatest, greatest profession. We're all called to this. You don't have to be a full-time Christian worker to serve Christ. We're all called to serve him, you know. So what keeps us going? What keeps us going against great odds, against so much discouragement around us every day, is to remember that we're called to share in his pain. But in that process, we're called to share in his plan, his purposes, magnificent. It's way above everything. You know, it's, it's just amazing privilege, you know. You may say at this point, wow, um, this sounds good, but it's just, uh, it's not for me. It's just too difficult, <laughs> too complicated. I'm a simple person. Um, I, I can't do it. It's just too much. Well, you, you can have comfort in that. Not only are you called to share in his plan, but you are called to share in his very power. He's right there to uplift you, to hold you. How do we see this? Now it says here, and um, um, verse 28, now him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, and we may present everyone mature in Christ. Notice that word every. It's literally, it's, we proclaim uh, warning everyone, teaching everyone with every wisdom, that we present every one, every person, every, every, every. That's power. And it says, first of all, we're warning everyone, putting their records straight. Sometimes you need to clean up as you're sharing the gospel from wrong thinking. We, pr we warn or we admonish, and then we teach, present the truth. And what happens is power in this gospel that we, that we hold, there's so much power in it. They can take any person and every person, if they believe, they can take it from, from where they are, no matter what their background is, what their situation is, how difficult that, and take that person to point of perfection. When they meet Christ, they're fully complete in him. That's what he says. For um, we proclaim and warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature, perfect in Christ at his appearing one day. For this, he continues, I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. That's power. Again, the words are, are so rich here. Um, you can put it this way, his, uh, literally, his power inflamed in activity within me. His power is inflamed in activity within me uh, with supernatural strength bestowed upon me. You know, so Paul is saying, wow, what keeps me going is not to know that I'm not alone in this. He's right there to give me the power to keep going, just to keep to keep going. Um, it's, he's not, he does not serve the Lord anxiously. He's not worried. He's trusting God. But he's not passive either. He's active. He's working. He's toiling with everything he's got. Uh, 
but yet uh, along with Christ's power working in and through him. You know, it's been, uh, it's been said that <clears throat> uh, by Hudson Taylor, he said, every great work for God is at first impossible. Then it is difficult, but then it is done. So how do we stay persistent? How do we do that? By remembering that we are called to share in his pain. Because we are called to share in his plan. And as we do, we are called to share in his very power. We're not alone. We can do it no matter how difficult. And we wait for that day when we would meet with him. Maybe close our time in prayer. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I uh, just ask you that we would always be mindful not to forget that when we falter and fall behind and retreat and fall short of your will to be, come back quickly because of the great privilege you have called each one of us to persist and given us everything we need to hang in there every day all the days of our lives until you come. What an honor, what a privilege. So we commit these thoughts to you, asking you for your strength to keep us mindful of your will. In Jesus' name, amen.